Hello, and welcome to the Null Channel. My name is Merrick Counts, and today we're going to go over the tech to watch in 2022. Let's start the year by looking at what I think is going to be best and the most important technologies to learn and be aware of in 2022. I was originally not going to make this video, as I think a lot of people cover this subject. But as you all probably know, I spend not only a lot of time helping people, but I actually work in the industry itself. It's not only important that I stay on top of trends, but I also understand what and why and how to implement them effectively. And I kind of disagree with some of the other people's technologies to watch for 2022. So let's go over the things I think will make the biggest impact next year and you should be on the lookout for. At the end, I'm also going to cover some of the things that I think are actually just overhyped and or might not be as big of a deal as some say. That being said, I want you to call me out in the comments and let me know trends I might have missed or things you think are more important than I have given them credit for. To be fair, Maybe I'm the one who's wrong. The very first one I think is going to be huge and is a little bit nerdy, and that's HTTP v3. No, not Web3, they're very different. HTTP version 3. Now, in fact, Web3 did not make this list, uh, but we'll talk more about that on later because it did make the overhyped list and maybe not the list that it wanted to be on. And if you disagree, stick around and hear my reasonings for that. Uh, and I'd love to hear your comments on it. Anyhow, to not get sidetracked, let's talk about HTTP v3. HTTP v3 is huge. It's faster and does a lot of awesome things, and you should be looking to utilize it if you can. I have played around with the reference implementation created by Cloudflare, and it's pretty awesome. It not only brings a speed improvement, but it also updates how communication happens at this layer. I'm looking forward to things like gRPC and communication-based projects that are based on the HTTP stack to implement HTTP v3. Probably the really big news here is the quick protocol. I mean, it's quick, but it's also quick. Quick looks to replace not only TCP, but it also but also TLS as it's built-in encryption, meaning you will not need the overhead of this extra layer. And anyhow, quick over IP is going to be huge and could and should completely replace TCP-based communications. And I'm pretty pumped about it. As always, if you would like a video on quick, you need to let me know so I can make sure to squeeze some time in this year to make a video on that. Now, I'm not here to say that Quick has no issues and that it's going to be really easy to adopt. And mostly around how to try and make it not entirely new, they used UDP datagrams, giving them backwards compatibility with things like firewalls. But as we all know, when you try to make everyone happy, you end up making no one happy. Okay, that, that was a little bit of a joke, but I mean, it does have some issues, but those are getting worked out quickly. And I think in 2022, we're going to see some frameworks start to support HTTP v3. All right, so what's the next thing on the list? Hardware acceleration. But Merrick, we've been using GPUs for machine learning all the time. This is nothing new. Well, this is where you would be wrong and very likely costing yourself quite a bit of money. What do I mean by this? Well, most people use TLS certificates. And I mean, if you're not, well, most likely all your data belongs to some Russian or Chinese hackers. But did you know that there is hardware acceleration for your TLS certificates? And I think in the future, companies like Intel and AMD and even ARM are going to see more and more hardware acceleration. A CPU is just general compute, meaning it's a jack of all trades and capable of dealing with anything that you throw at it. It's just not very good at it. It's not optimized for it. I think in 2022, we should really be watching what new things are brought in hardware acceleration. It's going to be important that you're up to date on these things because they could be huge cost savings when you accelerate off these workloads. 
So you need to be watching hardware acceleration and what it brings in the clouds, because not only can it save you processing power with hardware you already own and thus save you from needing to scale, but it can reduce your response times. And some have even said that it could accelerate your app's workflow. So uh, make sure you keep an eye out. And I think we're going to see quite a bit more common workloads accelerated out, not just video and crypto. And I honestly think that this is not talked about nearly as much as it should be. If nothing else, we should talk about the electricity. It can save you. If you care about costs, electricity, and possibly things like tail latency, then you should probably be watching hardware acceleration more closely. So let's talk about GitHub. Yeah, you heard me right, GitHub. You thought we were just talking about tech. Well, GitHub is making a lot of tech that enables you to collaborate on open source software and make awesome software projects. If you think that GitHub is just a place to store your code, you would be very wrong. Let's talk about how GitHub every year pushes the tech, enabling collaboration, building and distributing of software projects. Let's talk about how they are pushing the bar yet again. Just a few years ago, GitHub took on the entire CI/CD ecosystem when they released GitHub Actions, but they have not stopped there. They work to make every single open source project more secure with projects like Dependapot and advanced code scanning capabilities. And then GitHub has not stopped there. Now it is taking on projects and companies like Docker and Docker Hub and Maven Central. GitHub, known for being the place where open source is made, is not just making software development easier. It's now taking on the distribution issue as well, making it simpler and simpler to create, test, and publish on one platform. Their initial release for their container registry was almost useless as it required being signed in to download a container, even if that container was open source and freely available. And don't get me wrong, it took way too long for them to fix it. But now it is fixed. And now your container, your binary, and everything can live right beside the code that it represents. Not only has GitHub brought excellent software distribution, but they continue to expand their abilities with code scanning. Not only have things like Dependabot gotten better at ensuring your dependencies are kept up to date and no known vulnerabilities, but they continue to push forward with other projects and have acquired multiple companies to ensure the project and code hosted are of the highest quality. And they're really making it hard to pick another platform to host, collaborate, and distribute an open source project. In my opinion, it is by far the easiest place to ensure your project has security scans. And just recently, securely signed image and distribution of your code. I don't think any other hosting site gives you nearly as much, and I don't see them slowing down anytime soon. Now, I would be remiss not to mention their largest competitor, GitLab. I think they're doing some awesome work there as well, and would be what I consider the second best. And while I don't like them as much, they are not a bad pick and are also pushing the software development and dish delivery and distribution. Those are the three Ds of software development. Whether you use GitHub or not, GitHub is going to drive the entire industry into the future. Whether your feelings on GitHub or Microsoft and whatever they are, they are setting what I believe to be the gold standard for software project management, collaboration, and distribution all in one encompassing platform. So let's talk about security and what you can expect to see in 2021 there. From the recent Log4j vulnerabilities to Chaos DB and Grafana vulnerabilities, all the way back to Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities of 2018, when the first time we really realized just how vulnerable our hardware was. Security continues to be a hot topic. And as we layer on more and more complexity above the hardware, securing them all becomes more and more difficult. So security is a big topic, and I'm going to try and bring up the concepts I think are going to get even bigger this year, where you will see more focus and more scrutiny. At the start of this year, we saw what might have been the largest supply chain hack with solar winds. So I expect to see a lot of things around pipeline and supply chain security. 
And that being said, you need to understand the best ways to secure your pipelines, things like using and verifying signed packages or images. Also, how you can use things like OPA to ensure you are only pulling images in Kubernetes from trusted sources, and, and the list goes on. So make sure you secure your pipeline and stay up on the text that can empower this. There are at least two more areas where there were major issues this last year that you're going to see a lot of work being done on. Okay, so the next big security trend, or maybe I should say failure, configuration. Yes, configuration. ChaosDB and a plethora of other examples where configuration, or more aptly, bad configuration, was the reason for a breach. This is relevant and prevalent in Kubernetes. There are a lot of tools coming out to not only verify your configuration, but ensure it follows best practice. To this end, the National Security Agency, or NSA, and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, the CISA, released a cybersecurity technical report on Kubernetes, and mostly this revolved around proper configuration of your Kubernetes cluster. It's a long read, but you should read it. I'm not going to cover all the tools around security configuration because there are so many of them, and they really depend on what you're using. Kubescape is one of the ones for Kubernetes that was recently released and looks pretty cool, and it covers the aforementioned CISA and NSA collaboration report. But do you use PostgreSQL? Do you use Linux? What about containers? All of these things can and should have their configuration checked by a tool. And sometimes there are multiple tools. So understand what you are using and make sure you use some tool to automatically check your configuration. If you don't, you run the risk of using or pushing bad configuration that will make you run in a less secure way. I expect to see a lot more of this in the coming year, and I expect to see a lot of new projects, and I think this will get continued scrutiny over the coming year. So just do it. Make sure you're using configuration automatic configuration check it. All right, so the last one is good old bad code. While kind of a pipeline issue as well, what project you use are part of your pipeline, and no matter how good your code is, it doesn't matter. Log4j showed us this, and this is not me calling them out. Let, let me be clear. I don't think it's the maintainer's fault. I actually blame all of the company and projects that use Log4j and did not support it. It costs money to run code scanning, and it takes engineering time to find and fix and understand how these things work. But this being said, whether it is a project you use or your own code that you write, you need to make sure you have the right tools to detect and help ensure your product is safe. I see a lot of places like GitHub pushing ways to scan your code from things like Dependapot to check your dependencies or more advanced scanning that looks for paths through your code that could trigger a vulnerability. There are even entire companies fo forming and focusing around this concept concept, and I think it's going to be big, and you're going to see a lot more advanced code scanning in the future. The important part here is don't trust the code you write, so scan the crap out of it. Today, right now, stop watching this video and make sure your code is getting scanned. Then, then come back here and finish watching this video, of course. Did I say last thing already? Yes, yes I did. Well, I lied. I did not have a good category to put this in, but it falls under security just mainly because of availability is part of security. And that's chaos engineering. I really think that if you're not doing chaos engineering right now, you're doing yourself a disfavor. Now, it used to be very hard to do chaos engineering well, but that's all changing if you've adopted Kubernetes. There is, There are a lot of projects around Kubernetes, and I foresee a lot more that are going to let you do chaos engineering in your infrastructure. If you don't do it, you need to start doing it and looking around for projects that will help you do chaos engineering. I think that this will become one of the fundamental pipelines that you have to run. You know, it used to be like your CI CD that runs your unit test. And now you need your code checking that runs vulnerability tests against your code. And now 
you need your chaos engineering. If you want to run a highly available service, you need chaos engineering. All right, this next one, I kind of hesitate before mentioning, but multi-cloud. Multi-cloud sounds good. And I think a lot of large companies are going to push this path forward. And this, quite frankly, terrifies me. But before I talk about why I'm scared about it, please don't let my humble fears misguide you. Let's talk about why it's going to be huge in 2022. The main reason it's going to be huge in 2022 is Amazon tested how much of the internet would go offline if they went down. It turns out still quite a bit of it. And then just to check and make sure their first findings were correct, they did it again. And then just for kicks and giggles, they did it a third time just to make sure. Because of this, as well as general mistrusts of single clouds, I see a lot more large companies are going to push multi-cloud. If you think multi-cloud means the ability to run between two clouds, that's not what I'm talking about. And I don't mean just at the same time either. I mean, if one of them fails, if one of the clouds completely fails and goes offline, the one you use, you have systems in place to migrate traffic and scale. You ha And you have access to all of your users' data and you can make it available to them. To be clear, I'm just not talking about running a few Kubernetes cluster, but quite a bit more. Now, Kubernetes can be part of your multi-cloud strategy, but it's not the fix. Now, this might sound simple, and if it does, it means I maybe explained it well. And again, with projects like Kubernetes, your service might just run anywhere. But as I've said many times with Kubernetes, you need to know why you are doing it and what it is you're actually solving uh, before that you can say that it's simple. To be honest, with the tools we have on data transfer and the tech we have right now, I'm honestly not sure it's a good path for most people. Even the large companies that are going to push it, it's probably not actually cost effective for them now. But I'm putting on my 2022 roadmap because I think that in this year, uh, you're going to see quite a few projects created or updated to support this better. And those projects are going to and have already started to lay the groundwork to define not only how this is accomplished, but why. But I warn you, I see a lot of potholes in this path. If you are a trailblazer, this is a trail I don't think is blazed. It is a trail in need of blazing. So if that's you, if that's your company, then go ahead and do it. If you're not a trailblazer, I would say that you're probably better off waiting a year or two and just watching what happens. Now there are already, now there are already a lot of projects working to do this indirectly at least. Projects like Istio let you build stretch Kubernetes clusters in two different networks or even cloud providers. But these projects don't actually solve multi-cloud as they usually still have a single point of failure without more work being done by the engineering team. Though they are a fantastic start. Just to be clear, I'm not saying multi-cloud is going to be built on top of Istio or that Istio is the building block that is the project to be watching. I'm just saying things like this could be the building block you use to do multi-cloud. And if you have to do multi-cloud before I create the easy button for it, then it is a project you might want to look at as it might you might be able to use Istio to solve your problem. Anyhow, keep an eye out on those techs and how you might be able to utilize them and to solve your problems. All right, moving on. MLOps. I honestly thought last year was going to be the year of MLOps. I saw projects like Kubeflow that looked to put a stake in the gaping hole that MLOps would look to close. ML projects and their operations are hard from data to a trained model to serving it is hard. And last year proved just how hard that could be. Sadly, this planned Kubeflow domination never really came to fruition. That being said, there are plenty of projects and tools being worked on to fill this gap. And to be fair, Kubeflow is not out of the picture just yet. It moves slower than I expected and still lacks an easy way to use it without a full production deployment of Kubernetes and Kubeflow. 
if you think that running Kubernetes is a challenge, Kubeflow itself took a we don't make it and just tie it all together approach. And to be honest, I think that this is generally a good approach, but the co- the project became so complex that it's hard to manage. It's hard to understand exactly what you need and it's hard to just use. And I think this is hurting it. But the project is complex and the more and more I see of blogs, companies are solving the same issues with what seems to be a simpler solution tying together their own pieces. To be honest, I had thought and still do for the most part that it was one of the most promising projects out there, but it still has a few fumbles, it seems. I'm going to look forward to it in 2022, and hopefully it can push put 2021 behind itself, and it will become a, a little bit simpler to deploy. That's what I hope at least they're focusing on. But I have seen quite a few people solving this issue, so I will be keeping a lookout for what comes around over the next year. I think a lot of people are actively trying to solve the issue, and as you look to adopt ML, it's important to understand the projects that are going to empower you to take that to production. Let's move on to another bit of hardware. And I think 2022 is probably a stretch for it, but I'm looking at risk five. It's really probably more 2023 or 2024, but risk five is actually starting to see greater adoption. And I've seen a lot of single board computers come out with it. I honestly thought it was going to be in things like cell phones first, but at this point, I would not be surprised to see AWS, Azure, or GCP release server instance groups based on risk five in the coming years. This being said though, ARM in the server is here and you should be using that. It's the most cost effective way to run. And if you're doing microservices, most likely you already support it. Stop wasting money. And if you can't go to ARM, at least jump ship to AMD instances as they provide huge cost savings. Let's wrap up with the most important thing to watch next year, the fall of Kubernetes. Yes, it came in hot, and as most things, it's burning out quickly, too. I am sure most of you who have made it this far are knowledgeable enough to have seen this coming as well. With the new Challenger project Gary in the works, Kubernetes has probably seen its finer days, and Kubernetes engineers towards the end of 2022 will now be the new Fortran engineers. Okay. Completely joking on that last one. But let's talk about some of the things you might have expected to see mentioned, but didn't. Blockchain and Web3 are probably on the top of your minds. Well, I think Web3 is kind of the definition of the web now. I mean, I can run a website here out of my house, or I can pay someone else to run it somewhere else, and there's this network that lets me reach it by multiple different paths. Now, don't get me wrong. I find distributed consensus very cool. And I actually want to do more with distributed consensus. And if people were talking about problems distributed consensus could solve, well, then you would see me sitting right there beside them talking about the problems. But maybe we're overhyping what distributed consensus should and can solve effectively and what it brings to us. Don't get me wrong. I'm not one to blatantly call a tool evil either. I think that tools are tools and what people do with them are the evil part. I just can't help but think we're overhyping pretty much every aspect of distributed consensus. At the very best, you get huge server farms and then it's not very distributed anymore. In fact, it kind of looks like today's data centers. And to what end? I do think there are things we could do. Almost five years ago, you can ask some of my colleagues, I stated that distributed consensus could solve search, as I don't like major corporations or governments deciding what is true and what speech is fine. That was over five years ago. And maybe we get searched power by this, and I really hope we do. I'm after I'm actively looking forward to this, and I'll be the first to admit that I was wrong on something, but I don't think it will be this year, maybe 2023. That being said, a lot of the other Web3 uh, and blockchain type of technologies I feel are just a little overhyped, and I really am waiting to see where what they actually solve. Let's talk about Meta. 
both Facebook, now Meta, and Microsoft are really pushing VR. And I'm sorry, I just don't think 2022 will be its year. I'm quite happy with my webcam, and I actually think it will hurt remote working. Uh, don't get me wrong, I find the tech cool for sure, and I love playing around with it. I just don't think that it's that big of a deal, and it doesn't really change much. Again, I would be happy to be wrong here, I just don't think I am. Quantum computing. It's something I follow, and it's something that's interesting, and I think that it's a big deal. I'm just not sure that 2022 will be its year. Is it coming? Yes. Is it going to be this year? I don't think so. I doubt it very much. There are still quite a bit of things that need to be done and solved before it can have its breakout year. Don't get me wrong. I'm looking forward to it and would not consider it overhyped either. Just more like not quite yet. And so I look forward to when that year happens. Let's talk about the end of RAM or memory as we know it. People are working to get rid of your RAM as we know it. Same for DRAM now that I think about it. I just don't see these techs there yet. I feel like nowadays a lot of cool techs are talked about way before they're even close to doing anything. Remember back in the day when you learned about Google after it was a thing or about Windows or Linux? Not five years before they were even being worked on. I just feel like a lot of these projects are now overhyped before there's even a project to support it. All right, everyone, that was my list of top things to be watching for 2022. I hope you like my list. If you found something that I didn't cover that you think is going to be really important, please leave a comment and challenge me. I would love it when the community gets involved and talks about this technology in the comments. And if you did find something that I missed, I will make sure to pin that comment so everyone else can see it as well. As always, though, that's it for me today. If you like this video, you know what to do. Otherwise, if you did not like this video, I'm going to need you to hit that subscribe button, stick around, and see how many bad videos you can watch for science.